Good morning, and for those on the east and coast and further out, good afternoon and good evening. <laughs> great, great to be here in Alaska, Anchorage, Alaska. Um, thank you to Jennifer Gordon, Atlantic Council, of course, for putting this together, to Idaho National Laboratories, as well as the University of Alaska. It's, again, such a pleasure. Uh, for those I haven't met yet, um, this is my second trip now to, to Alaska. I, uh, Previous, previously served as uh, a commissioner on the U.S. Arctic Research Commission, and as you heard, uh, working on homeland security issues uh, as well, and um, and even at the State Department on energy resources. So it's it's a delight to be here among my amazing colleagues. Let me just do a quick introduction with everyone. We have Pat Pitney, who's um, the president for the University of Alaska System. Thanks for, for joining us today. We have... Um, Aaron Whitney, who is the director of the Arctic Energy Office, the U.S. Department of Energy, based here also in Alaska, which is great. Uh, Jeff uh, Waxman, did I say that correctly? Yeah. Hey, Jeff, yeah. thanks. Yeah. And he's a program manager for Strategic Capabilities Office, Office of the Secretary of Defense with the Department of Defense. So thank you for joining us as well. We also have Jin Yamaguchi. He is the special advisor to METI, uh, the Ministry of Economy and Trade Industries, as well as director of JETRO coming all the way from New York, so you definitely had a long <laughs> long trip as well. And finally, um, great to have Aaron Weston here. He is leader for nuclear safeguards, security, uh, non-proliferation -pro strategies, nuclear science and tech directorate within the Idaho National Laboratory. So thank you all uh, for joining us here today. And as you can see from the uh, board here, our panel is all about setting the stage, the economic and national security imperatives for leadership in low emission industry. Well, as I thought about that, and for those who may not be following this as closely, uh, thinking about what this means, especially when you break it down between the economic imperatives as well as the national security imperatives, they're not necessarily mutually exclusive. You know, when we think about the economic aspect of this, you're talking about cost savings, competitiveness, for example, technolo technology uh, advancements, uh, which we'll hear a little bit about, export opportunities even, and then the national security piece, which we'll hear a little bit about as well with regards to reducing reliance on sim single source uh, sources of energy, uh, whether it be coming from Russia and other places, uh, as well as even climate resilience and how the, ha that may impact food and water uh, resources. And finally, we'll talk a little bit about the geopolitical influence and soft power and what that, what that means. So let's, um, let's go ahead and, and turn it over to Pat with my first questions, if I may. Uh, I'd like to start with you as far as uh, someone here that's living and working in Alaska. Uh, you've served at the highest levels of, of Alaskan state government, and you're now the president, again, of the University of Alaska system. I'd love to hear just a little bit about why does Alaska, and even the Arctic as a whole, play such a crucial role in global economic competition? Yeah, I think, oh, it's it working. Work. Okay. okay. <laughs> um, well, thank you, and thanks for in inviting uh, us to, s to be part of this. Um, you know, with, in, in 50 years, we're, we're going to be the new south. Um, everything is going to move north um, as, as we see the climate moderating. And... With the opening of, of the, the Northwest Passage, we're going to be the center of, of commerce, or, the, or the, the center of that transportation. And that opening of access, we're not, where we're not the end of the road, we're the middle of the road. Um, Alaska becomes a very different place. But the, the net zero necessity, getting to uh, a net zero economy is, is such a necessary step. And, but we're, we're an oil state. We're a coal state. Our economics are driven by that. And going to a net zero economy, we have to also transition. Our mining resources are second to none. And, but you have to have energy to have those, those minerals uh, accessible, or accessible, but 
also to get to a low emission economy, you have to have those uh, minerals. And we are so dependent on the, most of the supply chain with China. Then you get into the national security imperative. Um, right here in Alaska, we have the opportunity um, to produce 47 of the 50 critical minerals and rare earth elements. It's, but you have to have affordable energy to get there. And we have to have low emission energy to get there. So I think it's, it's for us, for Alaska, it's, it's a transition of the entire economy. And it's, it's not tomorrow, but it's coming every day. I love the uh, Alaska State motto, North to the Future. So Absolutely. It, it truly does depict that. Thank you, Pat, for that, for that overview. Let me now turn to Aaron here. Aaron, um, with your role as director of the Office of Arctic Energy, I was reading about it a little bit more um, and thrilled that it was launched not too long ago. But it's described as bringing the Arctic to the US, um, as well as um, the, with the Department of Energy. And so bringing that department of the energy to the Arctic as well as the other piece of it. So I wondered, what does it mean to be that liaison between Washington, D.C. and the Arctic? Thank you. Uh, it appears my mic is working. Uh, so yes, our, our motto is <coughs> that we bring the Arctic to the Department of Energy, and we bring the Department of Energy to the Arctic. We are, as Dr. Goff mentioned, uh, the only regional office within the Department of Energy ecosystem. And there's something like 40 offices within the Department of Energy. Um, and we, it's a, it's a unique office. It's definitely the smallest office. Uh, and I'm humbled to be um, leading it and really excited that I can be here in my home state of Alaska to lead it because part of our job is to represent the interests of stakeholders here in the state and make sure that the department hears those. Uh, so we work within the department um, to advocate for all the voices within the state, um, including our indigenous uh, voices, which are so important. Um, and you know, we, you know, we have a huge representation of the nation's uh, tribes in our state. So that's a key part of the conversation. Uh, we advocate um, for Alaska's interests within the department. We also help with uh, international um, collaboration with other Arctic states, all in the service of, of covering science, security, and energy, uh, you know, those concerns for um, the nation uh, and for the department. And I, I wanted to add to, to President Pitney's great comments about being um, you know, the center of, of competition and economic uh, activity. Um, I think in some ways we already are in some sectors. Um, you know, for example, our airport mm -hmm. in Anchorage is on any given day, what, the second or third busiest cargo airport in the world uh, because of its proximity to uh, our Asian neighbors and as a refueling stop uh, for those airplanes carrying cargo back and forth across the Pacific. Um, and decarbonizing the aviation industry, for example, uh, is going to require us to think about new fuels, um, new types of aircraft, and I think that's one area among many that we can be a leader in because we're already at the center of that ecosystem. Uh, and maybe that's a place where new energy sources come into play for us. Um, so I just want to add that as, 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 as something that we can think about in terms of how we position ourselves as a state. Um, but these are the kinds of issues that I get to think about and that I get to bring before the department. Um, a lot of what I do is build relationships with other offices within the department <coughs> and make sure that they understand the uniqueness uh, that is Alaska um, and that we aren't like the rest of the United States. Um, you know, for example, we had uh, the director of the Office of Science up here a week or so ago, Dr. Berhe. We went up to Ukiagvik together. 
um, because the Department of Energy has some of the, I think, the largest investment in physical science you know, across the federal structure. We had uh, the director of the ARPA-E office up here, Evelyn Wang, looking at some of the investments up here. We had the deputy secretary, um, Dave Turk, up here in the spring. And there's, this interest is increasing. So we help bring um, those directors and those representatives up so that we can start to have the conversations that matter and start to focus um, attention, well-deserved attention, on the role and the potential that our state has to continue to be in the middle of it all and to, to lead from that position. That's well said. I mean, thinking about just from the locality, the, the geographics, you know, being this regional hub that could have that potential impact globally is, is tremendous. So um, let's turn to Jeff next. Jeff. We've heard a lot about the, uh, the use cases for advanced nuclear uh, reactors in Alaska, and of course, uh, Project Pele, which uh, I think Michael mentioned earlier in his, in his talk. Could you discuss with us just a little bit about your work at the Department of Defense uses for civil nuclear uh, re reactors overall? Sure, is my microphone, oh, I guess my microphone is, it's a miracle. Um, <laughs> okay, yeah, so we're building Project Pele, which is a transportable microreactor. Um, it's going to be built at um, well in Virginia, and then it's going to go to Idaho National Laboratory for initial operation. Um, and the DoD, you know, everything is about uh, logistics. If you think about it, you know, they say, uh, you know, amateurs study tactics and professionals study logistics. Uh, you know, we've won two world wars not because we had the best planes or the best tanks, but because we had the best logistics and we could get things where they needed to go. And you just have to stare at a map, or in fact, I don't think even a map is deceptive. Like you have to fly across the Pacific and understand how big it is, or, or in Alaska, how big things are. So while nuclear is valuable from you know trying to get off fossil fuel from a pollution perspective, it really, even people who don't care about global warming really care about energy for what the DOD does. Because everything that we do uh, in the modern DOD requires electricity and energy. If you think about really anything, it's not just the, the weapons, the radars, uh, just getting drinking water, uh, everything that we need to do, you know, the targeting uh, software, everything requires power. So um, we are hoping that Project Pele can be the, the pathfinder to allow us to move to uh, nuclear power because the, the energy density that nuclear provides is really like a science fiction capability. Uh, you know, it's two million times as energy dense as diesel. So, so this is a real opportunity there, and, and hopefully, we can, hopefully we can deliver, and hopefully in the near future there are Pele descendants uh, powering things somewhere in this state. Excellent, thank you, and hopefully we'll have time to talk a little more about the commercialization aspect of, of that as well. Let's turn to Jin. Jin, um, you know, Japan undoubtedly is America's longest civil nuclear alliance, uh, no doubt. Uh, what do you see as the role of civil nuclear cooperation when you think about the more, I'd say, broader geopolitical um, aspect of competition, you know, especially when you think about places like Russia and China? Okay. Oh, so my mic is also working. <laughs> so uh, first of all, thank you for having me here. Uh, uh, so I'm, it's very, uh, very great honor to be here. And uh, it's my very first time to visit Alaska. So uh, it's my uh, I'm very exciting to, to be here. And uh, yeah, so uh, I'm special advisor to METI, Ministry of Economy, Trade, and Industry. I work for METI around 25 years, and uh, around 10 years uh, I'm involved in the energy policy area. And, and my role here is to basically uh, enhance the relationship between Japan and the US, especially in uh, energy policy and also the decarbonization area. So my role is not just limited to nuclear, but also working uh, in a hydrogen space or a renewable, uh, that kind of things. But uh, uh, directing to your question, uh, so uh, especially uh, recently, how to collaborate in advanced nuclear uh, is very important. And uh, so there are several uh, areas uh, for cooperation, but I think the most uh, highlighted area is how to uh, collaborate in a SMR development. And uh, it's not just a project in US, but also in a third countries, so oh, we are collaborating in the project in Romania, where uh, we are seeking the possibility in Southeast Asian countries. And for, of, of course, uh, we, a Japanese company, are already invested in a uh, company where we have some uh, MOUs with the 
uh, new SME company, like a new scale we, uh, Japanese company have already invested in. So there are natural kind of collaboration between Japan and US. Mm -hmm. And for the uh, TerraPower, we have a uh, MOU for the visa Japanese manufacturer. So therefore, to advance or to support uh, the activities uh, of the uh, SME company uh, is a kind of natural collaboration. And also, how to uh, I mean, secure the f uh, I mean, fuel is also a very important thing. So yeah, we are also working on that area. And uh, recently, in the margin of G7, we have a, a lead up with the community to uh, advance our collaboration in uh, nuclear fuel. Thank you. Thank you very much. I mean, no doubt there's the momentum building even more with, with the recent uh, uh, forums that have been taking place. Let's uh, turn to Aaron. Aaron, um, you've, from what I've heard, thought a lot about the idea that leadership uh, in decarbonized value chains will be really critical or key to, to trade com competitiveness when we think about the future. Can you talk a little bit more about this, this notion, especially as it comes to trade? Sure. Um, I, I'm not sure if my mic is working or if you can hear me, but um, I think, you know, first you can just look to, you know, most of, if not all, of the, the very, um, you know, uh, in the most wealthy countries in, in the world are, are pushing to uh, decrease their emissions overall. And, and most of those economies rely on significant uh, manufacturing sectors. And, um, you know, as they continue to push to decrease their emissions, they also are going to need to protect their, their own economies. And so that, of course, is going to get to trade. They're in other words, they're not going to want to import products that have much higher um, emissions uh, uh, profiles, um, you know, simply to um, get a lower price at the expense of their own domestic manufacturing. And so, you know, their nuclear becomes a very important um, uh, solution in order to, for them to maintain a manufacturing sector and still have a low. Uh, Oh, so my microphone was not working. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I, I didn't think it was. Um, but you know, in other words, s simply what I'm saying is, is if, if a country wants to lower their emissions profile, they're not going to want to then import uh, manufactured products at the expense of their own manufacturing sector simply because the prices are lower. If the if the um, if the exporting country to them is is, is simply saving money by um, having a higher carbon uh, footprint with their with their produced goods. So nuclear energy becomes a very important input there because that's a way to still maintain a low um, emissions profile for the manufacturing sector. And if the technology is, is economically efficient, still maintain a low price. And so I, I think that's really where nuclear becomes important. Um, and then you kind of take the next step and you say, well, those other countries that are uh, going through uh, energy transitions are also going to want nuclear energy. And, and I think really this is maybe a, uh, important to think of is that the, when, when a, a, a nuclear energy provider, when you do an export, you're forming a very long-term relationship with the, with the receiving country. And this is something I think that the US and other like-minded countries, you know, we need to think about, like, including our, of course our partners in, in, in Japan, is how we think about nuclear exports in a strategic way. Um, uh, you know, that, that, that's something as far as the, the global leadership matter um, that I think is very important and something that really I don't think has happened fast enough. In other words, we haven't wrapped our heads around the idea that nuclear energy exports are far more significant and strategic than they ever have been. Um, and so that's something that I, I think is uh, going to be critical in this century. Well said. Thank you for that. Now, let's turn to uh, more at the state level here. You know, the Frontiers Project, you know, the collaboration works with first mover states uh, into advanced nuclear technology. So let me turn to Pat again. What are some of the benefits of, to Alaska on taking this role? Um, well, first and foremost, we have the highest energy costs. <laughs> um, that, and we are re remote. I mean, most of Alaska is on a, in a microgrid. We have one, one transmission line that runs what we call the rail belt mm -hmm. and connects towns from Homer to Fairbanks. And everything else is pretty standalone. And so, you know, Juneau is remote and it has hydro power. It's just one town. And 
then there's Ketchikan. It's just one town. So everything in Alaska is on these microgrids. Um, and many are small. Uh, so we don't, we don't have the infrastructure that makes business as profitable as it can be done somewhere else. And so that, that need for energy is key for an economic development. Um, but having, having it scalable and having the ability to access it in remote places is uh, very critical. Like in Fairbanks, which is a you know, pretty decent sized town. Wait, we do not have access to gas except for by truck. So they truck gas from down here to Fairbanks. So that is, that is not strong energy infrastructure. Um, so, and when we do, what we do have is use of, of diesel primarily and, and some coal. And that's, you know, that's not net zero. Um, it's, technology is getting better, but, you know, nuclear provides opportunity in this state that, um, that could really change how, how attractive it is to business. Um, but, you know, if, if we are going to have mining operations, that takes a lot of power. Um, you could have th that power for the mining operation then power many, many um, communities around it. And with, again, with nuclear, it, it's much cleaner. And the footprint, um, the carbon footprint is, is just substantially different and, and, and much better for, for the world. So there are, there's just no end of opportunity in Alaska for, for reasonable cost energy and clean energy. Uh, no, well, well said. I mean, the benefits are certainly endless in that. And as you said, especially with remote areas where there's a greater need, um, that, that would certainly fit the bill from that standpoint. Uh, let's, let's turn to Aaron. Aaron, how does your office, uh, the, the work there, how does it, as far as situating within Alaska um, and thinking about the broader Arctic context, um, especially when it comes to competition against U.S. adversaries and cooperation with our, all of our partners and allies. How does that dynamic work uh, with regards of being situated here in Alaska? Are you asking how our office? Yes, I'm sorry. That? Yes. Okay. okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, particularly with your office and the work that you're doing there. Right. Here. So um, we have a senior advisor in our office who is responsible for those um, relationships and keeping tabs on our international conversations. Um, not only with our Arctic neighbors, but also, uh, you know, with non-Arctic countries. Um, and because the Department of Energy is, is you know, the keeper of, of, of the nation's, um, you know, nuclear arsenal, that it, it covers those types of um, concerns. So, uh, you know, we've, we've, uh, we've got someone who is, is tuned into those conversations and those developments. And um, like I said, the Arctic Energy Office is, is primarily trying to you know, represent Alaska concerns. And then we pull in um, expertise from, say, the Office of Nuclear Energy uh, and, you know, to make sure that um, you know, we're leveraging you know, the vast knowledge and, and that they have. And, and you know, Nuclear Energy Office has a much bigger <laughs> budget than we do, and, and many more resources. Uh, but we can be, uh, you know, that touch point uh, for Alaska and for stakeholders to understand those interactions, or even to inquire within the department for us to to chase something down that might be of interest. Um, you know, I'll. Uh, you know, we've been enjoying, you know, conversations with some of our DoD partners here in the state as well. Uh, you know, helping them to start think about, uh, or not to start, but to continue thinking about some of their energy needs and, you know, what role our department might play in partnering with 
uh, the DOD to help with some of their remote operations, which are very similar to our remote communities. Is that with the, the Ted Stevens Center and others? Or We are in conversation oh. with the Ted Stevens Center. We're in conversation with folks on the base, um, you, you know, with, with uh, the Alaska Command, uh, and, and thinking about, you know, what it, what it would take to forge those partnerships, what it would take to do, uh, to understand those needs, and, um, and to, to, to move forward together. So. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Well, on that note, um, turning to Jeff, the U.S. military uh, has historically been a first mover, so to speak, uh, when it comes to new technologies. Uh, one example is from the internet to scotch tape, if you will. But uh, can you talk a little bit about the pathway uh, from military deployment of microreactors to commercialization uh, for civilian use? Yeah, so that, that's actually the history of nuclear as well. The first uh, commercial nuclear reactor that was ever built in Shipping Port, am I echoing? That was, that was built in Shipping Port uh, was a U.S. Navy reactor. It was actually an, uh, a surplus uh, aircraft carrier design, uh, and that became the design that went forward. So to this day, uh, every nuclear reactor in the United States that's commercial is a direct descendant of that naval reactor. In fact, when I took this job and I was trying to understand all the different things that went wrong in nuclear power so we could try to fix some of them, one of actually the things, arguments for things that might have gone wrong in the United States was actually this over-dependence on uh, light water pressurized water reactors, which make a lot of sense for a submarine but are not necessarily the most efficient from a commercial perspective. So our feeling for Project Pele from the start was that uh, our plan is that these reactors have to have spin-offs in the commercial space. That's the only way that we're making enough of these that the cost can come down. Um, and the fuel that we're using, which is triso fuel, was originally developed for the commercial sector. It was designed to be able to make next generation nuclear um, cheaper. And if you look at what most of the uh, startups and new nuclear companies are using, they're usually using triso or something very similar. So there's a real hope that, uh, that Pele can help to facilitate um, you know, commercial nuclear power in the future in the same way that the, that the naval nuclear uh, program did in the past. Great, thank you. Uh, Jin, um, this is certainly a tremendous, uh, tremendously exciting time for advanced reactor uh, industry overall. Uh, even though the broader nuclear energy industry has had it, some of its struggles over the last few decades, you know, their ups and downs, how can the US and Japan work together on nuclear innovation? Okay, uh, yeah, so oh, we can work in, in many areas, uh, definitely. Uh, so first, uh, I, I'd like to introduce that uh, Japan uh, recently uh, made it really clear to uh, really moving forward uh, our nuclear policy. So under this uh, Kishida administration, uh, earlier this year, we come up with a, a new policy uh, that includes a, a very clear direction that includes also the, uh, developing the uh, advanced reactor. So now we can collaborate uh, more uh, clearly uh, with the U.S. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, we have several uh, commercial uh, water demonstration project in U.S. and also in a third country to collaborate. And also, oh, we recently uh, announced that uh, we are uh, spending our money uh, for Japan's uh, fast reactor project. And for that, uh, of course, we can collaborate from the viewpoint of the uh, technical uh, information sharing. So that's also very uh, the possibility for the uh, cooperation. And uh, of course, uh, uh, the cooperation in uh, fuel, fuel uh, nuclear fuel is also a very important area. So some part of the uh, advanced reactor needs a HALU. So therefore, how to uh, secure the enough portion of uh, HALU is also important uh, point. So that part is also a very significant uh, area. Yeah, we, we hear a lot about the HALU uh, aspect of that because a lot of that does come from Russia, as many of you know. So being able to uh, obtain some of that without having that reliance is, is also critical. But thank you. Let's turn to Aaron. Aaron, we've talked a bit, quite a bit and heard about frontiers, of course, about how this isn't so much about uh, technology push, let's say, for advanced reactors um, as it is a demand pull, if you will, uh, for low carbon industrial processes. Can you talk a little bit about what that global demand uh, landscape looks like? Uh, sure, well, I mean, um, there's a lot there. 
Um, but I think um, maybe first we could just you know think about the general trajectory where we think the global economy is going. Yeah. Like I mentioned before, I think one way or another we're seeing um, a, a push from um, many countries towards lower emissions, and I think that's going to drive uh, even even those countries that aren't self motivated for lowering their emissions, they're going to. Uh, find a desire to do that in order to uh, have an opportunity to export to the, the countries that are pushing that. And so, um, you know, kind of like Jeff said, uh, nuclear energy is almost like a science fiction type power source as far as the energy density and also just the way it operates. It's a very special metal uh, that in the right configuration can be this very powerful battery that can operate for a very, very long time. And, um, you know, once that's integrated in an industrial process, you know, you could really optimize um, operations there and uh, in, 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 in undertake that process really anywhere where you can deploy nuclear energy, which is not restricted. Um, and so I think, you know, first we're going to need to look at um, a little bit on the supply side, the, te the technology as they're, as they're demonstrated and capable of meeting this need. Um, and, 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 then, and then that's going to sort of, I think, accommodate the, the desire across the global economy to meet this need. It, clearly, the desire is already there. You know, if, if, if when the technology is ready, there will be customers to adopt it. Um, but, you know, at least maybe to talk a little bit more about, since we're in Alaska, you know, the, you know, the, the, you know, the focus here in Alaska and the Arctic, um, you know, as, as the other panelists have said, you know, Alaska's got many uh, distinct communities that are not all tied to the same grid. And in many of those cases, they're going to have their own unique um, needs, whether it's just simply heating in the winter or some other process to expand, you know, to grow the economy there. Um, and that's really, I think, what the Frontiers uh, Project is about, is, is trying to find those um, kind of energy transition economies that have this need and then providing sort of the forum to sort of, uh, you know, be a resource to explain the, the capability of like, a, you know, this, this sort of what almost seems like a science fiction based technology, something that could really do something uh, in a much different way. So. You know, I guess what I'm saying is nuclear energy really is a game changer, not to overuse that term, but really can change the way entirely that something is powered. Um, and so, you know, um, I, I, I think, you know, looking at remote industrial uh, processes that, that really drive some of these economies, that's really the first application that I think can be the trendsetter, and then that can be expanded to the to the global economy. So, um, you know, some some of the some of the the communities uh, that were mentioned already in Alaska, those would be perfect examples of looking at where that demand is, seeing if that can be successfully deployed, and then replicating that across the across the world. No, that's a great point. I mean, the, the demand is certainly there, um, and as Pat was saying earlier, you know, with what we have currently. It's not sustainable. It's it's it'll it'll be a quick fix, but we have to think big picture. And as Senator Sullivan said earlier about all of the above strategy, I mean that's a key component of that. So you know, nuclear fits that bill again, and 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 can certainly be part of that energy mix as we diversify our, our sources. So, absolutely, thank you, um, Pat. Let's turn back to you <laughs> as we go around one more time. I think we're still okay on time here. Uh, as we approach this next frontier of nuclear energy innovation and hearing a little bit more about that, what do you see as the next steps to, to really ensure that this, these advanced reactors and the possibility of that can be delivered for, for Alaska? I know we were talking last night at dinner about deployment and what that can mean mm -hmm. and how we can implement that. What do you see specifically for Alaska? Uh, you know, socialization, mm -hmm. um, education, people need to... Uh, you know, it, it's um, some people are just hard stop on nuclear. It's like not happening. So, explaining the alternatives, um, explaining the the net zero economy imperative. Uh, I, I I believe Aaron is right that people are going to be more and more conscious of where where and how supplies and you know services are produced and 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 they're going to demand that they're done in a, a low low carbon <coughs> means so i think for for alaska it's getting enough people to understand it um, to have that 
that one demonstration um, where people see the, the outcome uh, and see the result and the, the actually the safe approach that the technology brings. Um, and and then, then I also think it's, it's going to take that support. It, it is going to be state, federal, industry, and, you know, an anchor tenant that's, that's going to be committed to this for a really long time. Um, I'm, I'm really excited about what uh, Business Enterprise Institute is doing in, in helping in these conversations and our Alaska Center for Energy and Power at, at UAF where the, we've, we, we're creating those conversations and, and there's actually a project going on right now where they're working with communities in Western Alaska to, to talk specifically about this opportunity. Um, and I, I think it's, it's just going to take a lot of repetition and we have to be able to point to some successes. Well said, thank you for that. Erin, uh, um, again, just such an exciting time for Alaska um, when it comes to energy and advanced nuclear energy overall. What do you hope to achieve within the next year? Now, with being the director of this office, any, any particular goals to think about for the next 12 months? Well, um, Dr. Goff mentioned it, but let me mention it again. One thing that we are very excited about, um, when I first started in this office and I was thinking about the different technology areas and how they apply in Alaska, and I was thinking about nuclear and trying to think about, you know, what do we need in these different technology areas? And um, lots of people are interested in nuclear technology in Alaska, but we're all working on that in addition to our 20 other projects. <laughs> and I said, okay, maybe the thing to do is to, to bring someone uh, to Alaska, you know, with uh, expertise um, who can be here in the state and be a resource. Um, and so that's what we're doing. We went to the Office of Nuclear Energy and we said, you know what, we would like to have a nuclear energy fellow in Alaska for at least a year based in Alaska. And so um, I'm happy to say that um, the Nuclear Energy Office said, great, we'll fund that. And the applications are actually being reviewed this week. Uh, it's really exciting. Uh, we're, we're going to put this fellow um, in Fairbanks. Uh, the Arctic Energy has office space there on the UAF campus, mm -hmm. beautiful office space. Uh, so the person will be integrated with some of the conversations that are happening. And the whole goal is to um, you know, you know, have this person be a liaison um, between Alaska and the department uh, to be a resource to the conversations that are happening in the state, to perhaps facilitate site characterization studies, to, to help move the conversations forward in whatever direction they go. Um, you know, we want um, stakeholders to have as much um, up-to-date and accurate information so that they can make decisions about their energy futures. So again, really excited about this development. Um, I'm a pretty concrete person, so boom, we're going to have a person here <laughs> who's hopefully very experienced who can um, you know, play a role in the communication and the socialization and the information preparation and uh, move us towards site characterization and uh, move us in whatever direction ends up making sense for our communities here. Well, no, that's wonderful. It's always great when you don't have to outsource and you actually have someone that can pick up the phone or answer the phone and be able to take on questions and projects and things like that directly. So that's that's great news to hear. Uh, Jeff, it, it's the same question for you as well. I mean, what, what do you think, well, as far as the Strategic Capabilities Office and Project Pele, what do you see happening uh, the next year? What does that look like? Well, um, the, the biggest thing is hardware. Um, you know, I've been very emphatic on Project Pele from the start that we're not trying to build the, the world's greatest nuclear reactor. Um, and I think that sometimes gets people in trouble. Um, engineers like to always make things better. Uh, and you need to just actually get actual electrons that need to actually be produced. Now, we're not going to produce electrons in the next 12 months, but the next 12 months, we should have the reactor largely assembled. 
Um, we're already making hardware now, and we hope that we'll be able to begin assembly in the spring. The other big priority is trying to move towards building the second one. Um, we're you know, having to stand up a new supply chain for nuclear power in the United States. The existing supply chain basically is just for naval reactors, and it's not quite the same. And if we just sit around for a few years uh, without building another one, you know, I'm, I'm staring at Joe Miller over there, who is probably on something later. He, he's more, even more acutely aware than me about uh, the standing army that he has at BWXT to help us build this thing. You know, we built a really strong team, not just at the contractors, but also at the labs, INL and PNL, et cetera. And we have got to be able to move to the next thing. This cannot be a museum piece that we build one and say, hey, great job, you know, everyone win your award and go home. Uh, this needs to be the first of many. If we only build one reactor, uh, I, I view the program as a failure. So um, that, even though the Pele will not turn on in the next 12 months, we need to have made significant steps towards Pele 2.0, even before Pele 1.0 turns on. So that's really what, what I'm focused on as a PM over the next year. Very exciting, excellent. Gene, how about yourself? I mean, as far as any forecasts or predictions for next year, especially when you think about just overall energy geopolitics, I mean, I know that could be a long discussion in itself, but anything that stands out to you for, for the next year? Well, uh, well, I, I have similar views uh, as previous speaker mentioned. So definitely the yeah, early success is very important. So for next year, maybe it's uh, just a kind of steady progress, but at least to see uh, concrete advancement is necessary. So. Uh, on nuclear space, we have many uh, projects that uh, Japanese government are supporting. So some of them is in a feasibility study stage and some of them is in under development, but uh, whether we can see the steady progress is a key point. Uh, so that's uh, kind of what we are seeking. And uh, yeah, I, I just wanna say also the micro reactor project, uh, we think it's very interesting and very impressive how you are working. And uh, definitely Japan is, uh, Japan is consists of many islands, so therefore we are very serious about carbon neutrality. So therefore, in the future, how to really decarbonize uh, every area uh, for that, uh, the, if that micro reactor project will be successful, definitely that will create a, uh, another option for also Japan. So that's uh, what we are thinking. Thank you. Thanks. And Aaron, last but not least, um, a lot a lot of discussions happening in the in the climate policy world, and we've got COP twenty eight uh, happening at the end of this year. We've got U.S. elections happening, uh, also just over twelve months uh, uh, about to happen. Can you leave us with some maybe some thoughts about uh, the relationship between climate and trade policy? Uh, sure. Well, I guess uh, maybe to take a nuclear energy focus on it. Um, I think that, like I maybe said at the beginning here, from the, the U.S. perspective, we need to adapt our mentality when it comes to nuclear energy exports. Um, and this is really just meaning like us winning in this, in, 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 in trade when it comes to low, uh, low emissions technology for nuclear energy. Nuclear energy is unique, right? I mean, it's not the same um, as when you export, um, you know, uh, a, another form of energy infrastructure. It's much more long-term, um, and it really is this long-term, uh, you know, significant, nearly a century relationship that you're going to have with the importing country. Um, and right now, you know, it's just a fact. Russia is the, the world's um, leading nuclear energy exporter. Um, I don't think anyone could dispute that. They have more projects being built in other countries than anyone else. Um, and I think that we're gonna see China emerge too as a significant nuclear energy exporter. So. This is certainly a competition that we can win, um, but it's one that I think we need to adapt our mindset and think about it much more strategically. I mean, when I say we, I mean the United States. Um, we have, a, I think, actually a, a, an early lead when it comes to microreactors, but we have to be thinking about all of the different uh, size to you know, larger SMRs and large uh, LNPPs, large nuclear power plants. Um, so climate, though, is what's driving so much of this, the you know, cl climate trade and policy. Um, and, you know, I guess I'm trying to think about how to synthesize this into one single point. You know, fundamentally just what I would say is, is if, if you think that the global economy is driving towards lower emissions technology, which I, which I, I think that is true. Um, you know, there's plenty of data out there. People can debate whatever they think about us having a trade policy, but I think that's true. So if you, if you rely on that premise, then you, you have to say, okay, well, nuclear energy is gonna be a big piece of that. And, and are we taking 
the smartest approach right now when it comes to exports, the global economy, to, you know, to the global market. And I think there's a lot that needs uh, that we need to rethink there. You know, just thinking about it more strategically and figuring out the, the way to, to win in this overall um, competition uh, because the implications are pretty serious. We, right now, like I say, Russia's the, the, the largest nuclear energy exporter. So, you know, this is something I think the U.S. and our, our like-minded allies need to think about in, in order to, uh, to retake that, that global leadership position. No, no, no doubt. I mean, and China's right behind Russia yeah. with all these new AP1000s that are popping up all throughout the country and elsewhere. So uh, that's a great point. Well, I'm told um, that we actually have enough time to open it up to the audience for Q&A. So I'd love to uh, turn the mic over. We've got microphones, a microphone in the back right behind you. Uh, to the right, if you if you have a question, uh, we can open it up to the panel. I'm sure, there's something burning out there. Oh, here we go. Uh, do you want to just bring the mac microphone or right, oh, right, right? There you go. <laughs> Okay, we'll try one more time. One more time. One more time. Okay, great. So my question is for Dr. Waxman. I had the privilege of spending some time with you yesterday. And a question that I've been thinking about since then was this. We've heard a lot this morning on this panel and others about how do we prepare the public for maybe a, th a change of thinking. President Pitney spoke to this issue about there are some people who are just hard stop on nuclear. From your perspective at the Strategic Capabilities Office, if you were looking at um, an area that could use some more education in from the area of public awareness of nuclear as a viable future, in fact, a critical viable future energy source, what would you say in your experience is one that is, is paramount? Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, I think, you know, I, we spoke yesterday about this, that you know, I'm a big believer that culture moves things a lot more than, than Excel spreadsheets. You know, there's there's nothing that, that any of us on this panel can say that's going to have more effect than you know a, a TikTok star or uh, or Miss America. Uh, but I, I think that you know we can exploit that. I was actually just thinking about recently the example in, in Japan about the fear around um, the fake fear about the radiation in the water, and I think the U.S. Uh, ambassador to Japan ate some sushi uh, from the water. Um, you know, I, I really think that if there's one message that I would like the culture to get across, it is that everything is radioactive. And we need to get past this fear of, oh, radiative water, it, right? It, it's, it's what is the scale, what is the safety level? And so, you know, my, my message to all the TikTok stars out there who I know are all watching online, <laughs> um, that if there's one message I, I would love for them to get across, it's, it's that. It's everything's radioactive. We all got dosed flying over here. Um, but it's it's really about the scale and the magnitude. So I don't know if others have a different or similar perspective on that. No, I couldn't agree more. It's the same thing as you were saying. Going through with the security uh, TSA at the airport, you're getting the sa exact same uh, exposure. And and Japan and the U.S. have been working very closely on on the water and the release of it all. So it's, it's it certainly has been tested, even though it is still an ongoing process. All the way in the back. Uh, Clay Copeland, Cordova Electric. Uh, just feedback because we did a really deep uh, customer service uh, dive in uh, Cordova, Alaska, which is on Prince William Sound, where a lot of our fishing fleets donate time to go pick up hundreds of tons of ocean trash. Perception is that there's uh, irradiation from Fukushima. These are some of the perceptional barriers that we have to get over. But I was actually astounded at the highly positive feedback we got, mostly 70, 80 to 100% favorable for nuclear with that one spike at zero of 10%, not under any circumstances. So I think that's a challenge. But my question is, strategically, Alaska is a developing state and thinking about an industry, if there's a way that we can look at solving several problems at once, for example, uh, whether it's the Bakken uranium deposits in southeast or Death Valley deposits out in the Seward Peninsula, what would it look like to develop a nuclear power plant to power a processing facility. Um, Alaska suffers from transportation. Nuclear is a highly valuable, very small sized commodity. Um, why, aren't we th why can't we think about production uh, and use uh, an actual deployment uh, as an energy source to be the catalyst for that? 
Uh, there's a question about production at the point of need. Uh, in other words, like pow powering a processing facility at the point of need. Yeah, so, um, and maybe Jeff might want to say a bit about this too, but certainly that's that's a need for the military, right? That, that, that's a, a, a major um, advantage of, of uh, the, the future Pele 2.0 that, that Jeff was alluding to. Um, and so people are thinking about this. There's no question. Um, you know, really, I think it comes down to um, first mover demand. Um, but what you've described, I think, is something that we've talked about. And my prediction would be that first we would see a, a defense application. Um, you know, that it could be as simple as powering a water purification system, or it could be something more sophisticated, like you know, a, a radar or something like that. But um, using the small reactors to power um, energy intensive equipment in a stranded location to you know you know bolster the operation at the point of need rather than you know um, you know in other words just reducing the logistics footprint is 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 you know that that's really the fundamentals of, of what we're looking at and then um, I'm optimistic to say that then I think that the private sector will want to replicate that and find a way to do that in an economic way and that could certainly you know, from what I understand about uh, oppor uh, um, economic opportunities in Alaska, be a huge uh, advantage to this state. Um, so, you know, Jeff, did anything I missed there? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, um, you know, one of the amazing charts, if you've ever seen it, is the correlation in, in nations and states uh, of energy use and, and GDP. Um, and it, it's almost perfect correlation. Uh, there's no such thing as a low energy, uh, wealthy economy. Um, and, and so, so, you know, nuclear really is, is unique in, you know, right now we're in a position in, in remote areas like Alaska or an island, we're in an energy starvation environment that when the military wants to set up another a radar site in the Pacific, the biggest problem is, well, shoot, how are we going to get, you know, we have to have another boat come each week in order, or another plane's going to have to show every two weeks in order to provide the power for that. And instead, we need to get to a world of energy abundance which really can only happen with nuclear or some other future technology that hasn't been invented yet, like fusion, where we suddenly have extra energy and we're saying, boy, what can we do with all this extra energy? You know, and, and how profound that might be for, for really anywhere. And it, it makes the, the tyranny of the logistics, which are one of the things that make the economic growth in Alaska difficult, it maybe makes that less of a factor if you can make more of your energy locally. I'm not sure if that answers your question, sir. Maybe I didn't state it properly. So we have known uranium deposits in southeast Alaska and Seward Peninsula. So the goal is to develop those deposits to provide a fuel source, but nuclear uh, power plant on the site to provide abundant and low-cost power to start that um, process. So think about the whole process holistically, where you're delivering nuclear fuel at the outset to start the mining process, build your production facility right there so that you're shipping out a low-volume, high-value product and becoming a supplier into the market. Yeah, I mean, I, I remember we spoke with um, some oil and gas uh, drilling companies in the United States. They mentioned how one of the reasons they use fossil fuel on site is that the cost of getting transmission infrastructure out to the mine was something on the order of a million dollars a mile, um, which considering that prices tend to be more expensive here and your distances are longer, that sounds horrific. Um, so yeah, the ability to, to use uh, energy on site potentially opens up all, all sorts of things. I mean, uranium is kind of like rare earths. Um, you know, rare earth metals are like the Holy Roman Empire. They're neither rare nor earths. Um, they're everywhere. The difficulty is the energy and the process and, and the, all the chemicals you need to do to, to, to process them. So, yeah, there's definitely a potential for, for a state like Alaska and all sorts of areas uh, in mining, including uranium. I don't, know. I don't want to dominate all the questions here. So. But that abundance is here. That's, that's the irony of it all. We have it. It's just a matter of how we can produce it and bring it up to scale and, right. and, and, and the infrastructure behind that. that. I think that's the frustrating point. Um, and Alaska is a, is a true model and example to have that great potential. Hi, Diane Hirschberg. I'm uh, with the Institute of Social and Economic Research at UAA. And I am also involved uh, collaborating with ASAP on these community conversations around um, the possibility of um, uh, using nuclear energy in rural Alaska. And I think one of the things following on the last two comments, is it's not just concerns about nuclear energy itself, but it's actually profound distrust of the federal government 
because of past actions in this state. And so my question is, what are the opportunities for us who are doing this work with local communities to perhaps work with um, our, our federal partners to have a very, very frank conversation? There was, there was uh, a response recently um, and a webinar held in response to some of the feedback we'd shared and frankly, it was not well done. And in fact, I think it made things worse in some cases in the way that the conversation was handled. And so we'd really like to, I think a lot of people are actually not as worried about nuclear and they're very interested in the private industry and in the state being involved, but they're concerned about how the federal government has um, responded, um, particularly I'm thinking about rural and remote indigenous communities. So, so how do we get in that conversation in a productive way to get past some of these missteps? Well, as the federal representative up here, I think that's directed at me. Uh, and I certainly uh, invite input. Um, you know, part of bringing a nuclear fellow up here is to um, have someone who not only understands the technical aspects, <coughs> but also someone who can engage with um, community members and community concerns. Um, so that will be part of, of, of that person's uh, purview. Um, I guess I would like to talk to you maybe more specifically about uh, some, of the spe some of the examples that you're referencing because um, I feel like I spend an inordinate amount of my time representing our state's um, community concerns to the department. Um, I am a cheerleader internally and I'm constantly calling other offices and saying, hey, you know, we don't have reservations. We have native corporations um, or, you know, we have native consortia um, which don't exist in other parts of um, the nation. And uh, the more our office and I can learn about these specific concerns, the more that we can make sure that they are voiced and heard, uh, at least within the Department of Energy. Uh, so <coughs> more to come. So I, I want to give an anecdote about that, which was when I got to the airport here uh, yesterday, day before, whenever I got here, at the rental car counter, um, in order to get some government discount, I had to put what agency I was with and what the phone number was. <laughs> and I said, I, I don't know if the Pentagon has a phone number. I, I, didn't, I Googled Pentagon yeah. and came up with a phone number. But that's kind of a joke. It doesn't really matter. Yeah. But if I'm in some local community in Alaska and I'm not happy with what the DOD is doing, who do I talk to? What is the phone number for the Pentagon? And so... <laughs> What we did on Pele, right, we're going to be building at Idaho National Laboratory, not building, but operating on historic tribal lands. And so, you know, the Shoshone Bannock tribes out there, who do they talk to? And so it was important for us early on to go out there and be to say, hey, look, this is me. I've been running the program. Here's my card. Here's my phone number. If you have a concern, you reach out to me. And I think that's super crucial because, yeah, trust in government is, is down, but the government doesn't deserve trust just because it's called the government. And mm -hmm. so I think having a face and just hearing people out uh, so in, in our case, the tribes wanted us to move from one spot to a slightly different spot, which we accommodated, and they wanted everyone on site to um, take a certain cultural uh, sensitivity or training uh, course to understand what to do if they uncovered something on the site. We we're happy to implement that. And then once we did that and they knew they were being listened to, they felt way more comfortable. And so I think it's responsible of the government to do that and not just expect, particularly in the 21st century, that you can just show up and do what you want and people will trust that what you're doing is safe. Hi, my name is Mead Treadwell. I'm a former Lieutenant Governor of Alaska and uh, supporter of all of the above energy in, in the state and work in natural gas. Uh, my first question for, for the panel is, what's your feeling about uh, economics? Where, uh, we have a clearing price. Uh, I don't know, Clay, what's the clearing price for power in Cordova? Seven and a half cents for hydro. Seven and a half cents for hydro. Are we gonna be able to beat that how and whenever, and uh, you know, it's 40 or 60 cents in the bush. 
Uh, I guess the second question, and because DOD has done, has probably built more nuclear reactors than anybody, uh, why can't we pull up, uh, put a submarine nuclear reactor on a on a barge and pull it up to a to a community like the Russians did at Belivino, or or now now further north of Belivino, and just get this done? So there's two reasons why you can't just pull up an aircraft carrier and, and power it. One is that the Navy- Not an aircraft carrier, uh, yeah. the, the reactor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But so part of it is, is that the Navy doesn't want to have their, their ships tether. But the reason why you can't just build a naval reactor is it's extraordinarily expensive. The, the performance that's necessary for those reactors is not necessary for a commercial reactor, but those, what those reactors can do. Um, in terms of, of cost, um, you know, that, that's a key question because I don't think microreactors are ever going to be seven cents a kilowatt hour. And in fact, I, I think that the microreactors at the one to five megawatt range are going to struggle to get below about 30 to 40 cents a kilowatt hour uh, in the future, which sounds scary when you're from Virginia, but there are a lot of communities in Alaska that already pay more than that. There's a lot of islands specific. Um, I think to get your prices down in the seven cents a kilowatt hour range, I think you need bigger reactors, maybe in 100 or 200 megawatts. There's just a lot of scale and in the physics of the core, in terms of the efficiencies that you could get and other things that will allow those prices to come down to that range. But I know there's some startups here who maybe might want to, uh, I see Doug Burnow over there, might have some other thoughts about what prices can get down to. Right. Were you gonna, uh, we're about to wrap up. Just a quick And Jeff, if I'm not mistaken on the on the question about why we can't have these reactors here, isn't it fuel also the issue? The HALU is is a, yeah, well, a challenge. Well, naval reactors operate off the HEU, which is even harder to get. But yes. but really, um, you know, you want to take the concept of a of a nuclear reactor, but try to you know, it, I can't get into the materials that get used in naval reactor, but it's a lot more exotic because of what they have to perform. So you wouldn't want to use that exact design, um, but certainly we've tried to take the expertise of, of Navy Reactors team. I mean, our prime contractor is the same contractor that builds the reactors for the Navy. And we've tried to find the balance where about half the team are Navy Reactors people who have that experience, and then the other half are kind of outside that, kind of the advanced reactor, you know, think a little bit differently and try to blend those two worlds together and hopefully get something that is, has the safety and, and um, you know, the reliability of a Navy Reactor, but hopefully a little bit cheaper is the goal. And as far as the cost competitiveness, again, it, it's going to be a quite the challenge, of course, initially when, with any startup costs of any type of technology that's, that's emerging or, or, or present. But I can't help to think we were talking about this last night, 10, 15 years ago, the same was said with, with renewable energy and, 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 and how expensive it was. And now that that's levelized, it's, you know, it's, it's looking at the long-term uh, costs ahead of, of, of what, what you have and that energy mix so you are not relying on that single source. So that's another aspect of it. Can, we, can you deal with the high costs up front versus what it, the implications can be in the, in the long term when you think the next 10, 15, 20 years or so? Um, anyway, we are running out of time. Uh, I'll, I'll leave it to the panel. Any, anybody last closing remarks at this point in time before I turn it over to Jennifer? <laughs> A, a big, a big thank you to the to the Frontiers project and for being in Alaska and 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 for the people participating. It's it's very valuable and we uh, we we're hopeful for the next steps. Indeed, and looking looking forward to some of the highlights and, and takeaways that we can look to move the needle as we think about next year's uh, gathering as well. So thank you all very much. A round of applause for our great panelists tonight. Today.